Pursuant to Section 84-1411 of the Nebraska Statutes, notice of this meeting was given on March 18, 2022. The meeting will convene at 6.30 p.m., and visitors may obtain a request to be heard form from staff for any presentation they may have for the meeting. In accordance with policy, the request to be heard forms must be submitted to the secretary within the first five minutes of the board meeting in order to be heard at this meeting. Agenda items are subject to reordering at the discretion of the board president. Please attend the entire meeting to ensure you are able to hear any discussion.
Pursuant to Section 84-1411 of the Nebraska Statutes, the next regular meeting of the Board of Education of Douglas County School District 0001 and the Board of Educational Service Unit Number 19 will be held on Monday, April 4th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the Board Meeting Room of the Teacher Administrative Center, 3215 Cumming Street. The agenda will be kept current and available for public inspection in the Office of the Secretary of the Board of Education at the Administrative Building during regular working hours. Pursuant to Section 84-1412 of the Nebraska Statutes, the public is hereby informed that our current copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted in the Board Meeting Room on the North Wall. Please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Vice President Erdenberger will lead us in the vision and mission statement. Thank you. The OPS vision is every student, every day prepared for success, and the OPS mission to prepare all students for success in college, career, and life. Um, I did hear from Mr. Snow today that he will be about 15 minutes late. Roll call, Mr. Ray. Cassidy? Here. Erdenberger? Here. Head? Present. Holman? Present. Juarez? Here. Cracky? Here. Smith? Here. Snow? Teeling? Here. Eight present. I will entertain a motion to excuse the absence of Mr. Snow. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Smith and seconded by Mr. Teeling. Any discussion? Mr. Ray? Keelan? Aye. Cassidy? Aye. Erdenberger? Aye. Hedden? Aye. Holman? Aye. Juarez? Aye. Cracky? Aye. Smith? Aye. Eight? Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to board and superintendent communications, Dr. Logan? Good evening, President Holman, Vice President er Erdenberger, members of the board, those here in attendance, and those watching the stream from home. Today begins the fourth quarter of our school year, just after spring's arrival, and there is much to be excited about. Tonight's consent agenda includes more items for our four new schools, which are nearing completion. Our tax slideshow will have regular updates from each of the schools through the spring and the summer. That slideshow will play here in the boardroom for guests to watch before Board of Education meetings. Staff and families can look for additional photos of bond work in this week's edition of Inside the Omaha Public Schools. And at the end of this month, I'm taking the superintendent student advisory on a tour of our new high schools. Tonight, staff will ask for our board's approval of new K through 12 mathematics textbooks and resources. Our district has balanced many priorities through this school year and our curriculum instruction team maintained momentum with these instructional updates for our students. Our board and community may recall other similar curriculum and resource presentations and adoptions in recent months in accordance with board policy. This item, like other updates, includes community engagement both in person and online. Our district hosted four community events between November and January to offer a look and to seek feedback on what is before board members tonight. This week also begins spring testing for many of our students. We encourage all families to ensure students are well rested and participate in school breakfast. This is valuable every school day, but especially when students have this opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge. State assessments and map testings are, task testing are two ways we monitor a student's strengths and opportunities for academic growth. While state assessment data will not be finalized until the next school year, map results are available more quickly. These data points will also be available for educators on Articulation Day in April. On that day, teachers will gather to discuss student transitions from one school year to the next. Another strategic plan of action project, middle schools will soon enjoy new websites. Following the launch of our new district site last October and new high school sites in December, middle level sites debut April 1st, and there's no joke in selecting that day. Our new websites are easier to navigate with important news and information up front. Elementary sites will launch in several groups this fall. 
Lastly, I have several congratulations. Congratulations to Ariana Hartfield and Chong Clay of Vincent High for earning 25th place in the annual National K-12 Ceramic Exhibition in Sacramento, California. Rod Mullen of Central High for earning History, Nebraska's Excellence in Teaching Award. Anna Hayden, Jonathan Flores Mondragon, and Christian Gallagher of North High for qualifying into the Robotics World Championship. Alejandro Marquez of North High for earning the Runza Student of the Week recognition and scholarship. Still haven't had a Runza. Uh, I also want to welcome and recognize Dr. Gregory Betts, who is here with us, if he could please stand, who is on our agenda tonight with an appointment as Executive Director of Human Resources. Pending our board's approval, Dr. Betts will join Omaha Public Schools from neighboring Westside Community Schools, where he is currently the Director of Elementary Education. We welcome Dr. Betts. That concludes my remarks for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Logan. Ms. Cracky? I just wanted to note that this weekend um, on Friday, uh, Margo and I went to the military ball at the Bale Center out there and all the girls had their pretty gowns on and we had saw many, many bars of many things that the uh, students had accomplished as they went through the ranks there and were introduced and then they stayed and danced and uh, we enjoyed seeing that. I hadn't seen it for a while. So congratulations to all of them. They did a good job. Great, thank you for sharing. And I just wanted to quickly um, give a shout out and recognize all of the volunteers who assisted with Say Yes to the Prom Dress um, several weeks ago. It was a huge success. and. Um, it was a really great time, and it's always so um, thrilling to see the smiles and the enjoyment in all of our young girls' faces who were able to take part in receiving the dresses. So thank you to all who contributed and all the time that was spent in uh, getting this set up for our young ladies. Moving on now to School Spotlight, Mr. Maskell. Good evening. You thought I forgot about you, huh? I did, but glad to be here to celebrate. Good evening, President Holman, Vice President Erdenberger, members of the board and Superintendent Logan. Tonight's OPS Proud Spotlight recognizes the winner of our Omaha Public Schools Spelling Bee, Hamdul Urdimi of Buffett Middle. He's very humble. He's the kind of kid who um, really wants to do well and really has high expectations for himself. He takes it very, very seriously. Um, it matters a lot to him. I think he's got this huge competitive spirit and um, having done it as a younger Bobcat when he was, I think, in sixth grade, now being in eighth grade, trying to win that again, he, I think he wanted it pretty bad. So there was one in fourth grade, they, they just like made everyone do it and then I did it and then I got interested in it. I would see him studying in the cafeteria. I mean like there is, every moment, he, and he tries to play like he didn't, but every moment he could, he was studying his words. The regional one, I, I made it to like the oral rounds. Tom Duel won two years ago and then COVID hit and so he wasn't able to advance onto the regional competition. So it was really fun seeing him advance this time and actually get to go to the regional B. I placed like six, like, Four other kids got out in the same round as me. He's just that kind of kid. He's he's quiet about it. Um, he doesn't brag about it to his friends, but um, he's serious about it. Congratulations to Hamdul, our spelling bee champion. Thank you so much, Mr. Maskell. Moving on now to public comment. Tonight we have three speakers who have submitted requests to speak forms. The board has adopted policy 8346, which provides public comment for a period of one hour. That same policy limits individual speakers to a maximum of five minutes. We ask that you respect that time limit. Mr. Ray will let you know when you have one minute remaining and when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you are in need of an interpreter, please let Mr. Ray know and one will be provided for you. Also, please make sure that you refrain from any applause or other outbursts during the presentations. If the subject of your public, excuse me, public comment is related to a particular student or staff member, we ask, <clears throat> excuse me, we ask that you not identify the student or staff member and instead provide that information to Mr. Ray. He will assist us into looking into to those types of specifics for you. If you do not get an opportunity to speak and would like to submit a written commentary, please provide it to Mr. Ray. 
he will make sure that each member of the board gets a copy. As a reminder, with the passage of last year's LB 83 by Nebraska legislature, the Board of Education is legally obligated to require any member of the public desiring to address the board to identify him or herself, including an address and the name of any organization you may represent, unless the requirement is waived for security reasons. The following individuals have requested that the board waive the requirement that they state their name, excuse me, state their address at the podium for security reasons. And tonight we have Michaela Kayser. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Thielen and seconded by Mr. Head. Roll call, Mr. Ray. Cassidy. No. Erdenberger. No. Head. Yes. Holman. Yes. Juarez. No. Cracky. No. Smith. No. Thielen. Yes. Three yes. Three three yes. Motion fails. We ask that all other individuals please state and spell your first and last name, state your current address, and let us know if you are here representing any particular organizations before you begin your public comment. In addition, we ask that you remain seated until called to the podium. Please remain at the podium and do not approach the board table. If you have materials to distribute, please let me know and Mr. Ray will come and get them from you. It is now 6.42 p.m. and our first speaker is Mr. Donnie Johnson. Good evening, Mr. Johnson. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Dr. Holman, I presume? Okay, uh, Donnie Johnson, 4928 North 52nd Street, Omaha, Nebraska. The Johnson and Question Foundation. And Mr. North Johnson, I'm sorry, would you spell, in, you spell your first and last name before you begin as well? Thank you. Okay, Dr. Holman, yes, please. Uh, could you say that again? You want me to spell my last name? Spell, yep, spell your first and last name. You're not going to get me mixed up with this Irish guy, are you? Excuse I don't me. think so. <laughs> okay, D-O-N-N-I-E. Danny is D-A-N-N-Y, but mine is D-O-N-N-I-E, J-O-H-N-S-O-N. No. I can't say, uh, let's start over here. The Johnson and Question Foundation, the North Omaha Concerned Citizen Foundation, a state and federal 501c3 nonprofit organization organized and established by Donnie Johnson, owner and operator, of Solar Beauty Salon from 1977 to 1985, the largest African-American hair salon within the Midwest. Investments in Nigeria, Egypt, Somalia, and Sudan, and Uzbekistan, Jikistan, and working with other investors within the African continent. Uh, my veteran administration counselor suggested I mention some of my accomplishments. She said this would be, she said this wouldn't be bragging. A Navy teaches us just finish the job and move on. The curriculum versus the Peace Corps student exchange and young adults participating within the international community. African-American and Hispanics need access to revenue to study abroad within the Af international community. Dating back to 1981, Dr. Dodd and wife, his wife, Dr. Bernice Dodd, and other prominent African-Americans within Nebraska all agreed within with myself and the business community. International affairs, researching job opportunities for African Americans and other minorities should be done. They should, be, they should and shall be given access and opportunity to participate and compete for jobs within the global economy. So help them God. I believe this can create new opportunities and new challenges for themselves. The city of Omaha, the state of Nebraska, and the United States of America. Remember, President Bush Jr. said, no child left behind. But I wanted to go back to where Central Park when I had seen you, where I went to elementary school, and I was discussing about this art. Art is a wonderful thing, but I'll tell you what our day was like real fast in 1965, in the fifth grade. The first hour, we're doing calculus and physics. The second hour, we're doing law and government, studying law. The third hour, we're doing science. The fourth hour, we're doing medicine. So I'm trying to figure out, how did those folks have all that time for that art up at the school at Central Park? Now, we ain't even got to lunch yet. 
and we're still doing all that. And then on this afternoon, part of our fifth grade, we're taking a mock SAT, ACT test score. And then just before the bell ring, the teacher said, if I catch any of you watching the clock, before we figure out how John Glenn suckered the globe, I'm gonna keep you out to school. I decided to look at the clock and decide I'm gonna make sure she keep me after school because she was so beautiful like you, Dr. Hoban and Dr. Logan. I stay after school. Thank you. Next, we have Michaela Kayser. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Michaela Kayser, and I would like to not say my address because I'm a minor. I'm 17. I could be a junior in one of your schools, but I was homeschooled, so that's the reason why I'm not. And I don't want to give my address for security. Ms. Kayser, I'm sorry that the board already voted that you do have to provide your name and your address, please. Okay. My name is Michaela Kayser, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A-K-A-Z-O-R. My address is 11619 Grand Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska, 68164. And I am here today to speak about um, critical race theory. I want to first begin by introducing myself. My name is Michaela Kayser, and I'm a 17-year-old college student who loves Jesus with all of my heart. I attend a very diverse ch church here in Omaha, where there are just as many people of color as there are people with white skin. I attend church multiple times a week, where I worship besides Christians of all skin colors. I attend two prayer groups throughout the week, where there are people of different skin tones. I have a pastor who is like a second dad to me who has dark skin. I do not care what color a person's skin is because I know that a person's skin tone doesn't define them. I live my life the way that MLK dreamed. I, as he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they are not judged by the color of their skin by the content of their character. Critical race theory is the direct opposite of what MLK stated. Critical race theory is when a person's judged based on the color of their skin and their character doesn't even matter. As stated in Omaha Public Schools Library's fall 2020 newsletter, it states that same conviction of working as a collective was maintained as the success and triumphs of black people during the Reconstruction were being reversed and as Jim Crowlows was sought to reestablish white supremacy at the turn of the 19th century. Teachers in segregated black schools band together to create state and local black teacher associations with the intention of developing curriculum that empowered black students with a sense of cultural knowledge and pride, high expectations for student achievement in academics and civic engagement, and maintaining a network of support while strategizing as the leaders in local activism. Those early educators in segregated black schools united to, to instruct students in their classrooms, but primarily they aimed to create a new society that was inclusive. And that was needed back then because there was segregation and it was not good back then. But then the the newsletter continues by saying, in the same spirit of the em emancipated educators and those that served in the segregated schools, the Office of Equity and Diversity has established a collection to support developing education and bringing us together. Over the past year, an inclusion committee was created to serve as an employee resource group and community connect point to support the district on workplace environment and student supports. So does this mean that we as a society are in the same position as we were 150 years ago? This says that we are. Does that mean that we are just as divided as during Reconstruction and while Jim Crow laws were in place? This says that we are. As I look across the boardroom, I think otherwise. When I look across here, I see five people on here, the majority of the board, who have dark skin. I don't think that that's segregation. When I think about my time in public school, though I did not go to OPS, I think otherwise. I attended an elementary school where there are just as many children with dark skin as there were children with light skin. When I attended public high school, I had kids in my class with dark skin who were learning the exact same thing as I was. They were not being oppressed. I understand that there are some communities out there where children come from backgrounds that are not as flavorable as my background was, but it has nothing to do with race. I do see through working at a mission here in Omaha that there are families with white skin that are going through the same thing as people with dark skin. The fact is skin color is not the root of the problem and critical race theory says it is. Critical race theory wants every white person to believe that they are racist while making every person of color think that they are oppressed. I have a friend who told me that she would never want her daughters to hear someone tell them that they were oppressed because of the color of their skin. When I have kids, I don't want them being told that because they are white that they are automatically racist and oppressors, even though they are five years old. That is disgusting, and I don't want my generation and the ones after me to be told this either. 
critical race theory teaches us. One minute. The United States of America has grown tremendously over the past 150 years, and it is disgusting to hear that OPS has created a committee with the mindset of people 150 years ago. I want my kids to live, look at this nation and celebrate how far this, this nation has come, and not be told that this nation is just as evil as it was 150 years ago. As I grew up, I grew up in a culture where we loved everyone just like Jesus does. And critical race theory will teach kids to hate one another. Every person is loved by Jesus and made perfectly in his image. As, by, as the Bible states in Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. Parents and other students, we need to stand up and speak out against these injustices and speak truth because when you speak truth, Jesus is on your side. And if you're on Jesus' side, as Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? God bless you. Next tonight, we have Kiana Walker. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Um, you need the name, my spelling of my name? Yes, the spelling it, of your first and last name and your address. Okay. Um, it's K I E Y O N A. And then it's Walker, W A L K E R. Address is P.O. Box 31464, and that's here in Omaha, Nebraska, 68132. Oh, oh sorry. Um, I normally wouldn't do this, but um, an experience in which that I had experienced today brought me out because I, I have a, a, a 10th grader um, who attends one of the, well, attended one of the OPS schools. Um, and I'm a first responder. I had to leave back um, in September of last year while my daughter had attended one of the OPS schools. We transitioned out due to me having to travel for work. Um, just recently returned um, this past Saturday and this morning um, had to go to try and get her re-enrolled in one of the, the, the high schools here with OPS um, and, and had a significant um, experience that left me shaken and very concerned um, as a parent. And I just wanted to come to be the voice for my child and other parents that may be experiencing it. I'm sorry. Um, upon going into the school today, um, we were, we were um, talked to unprofessionally by one of the staff members at this particular school. Um, as this staff member did not know that I was my daughter's mother at that particular time until I voiced it. Um, the interaction was horrible. The things in which that was said to us was belittling and I was shaken. Needless to say, um, at that particular moment, um, I had decided that I was gonna step into the hallway and in the midst of me stepping into the hallway, I noticed that there was a child that was horribly frightened and a male and was in a women's bathroom with about seven to ten girls young ladies that were was around this person and there was two individuals that had came and was talking horribly to this child and threatening this child um, left me shaken um, looked around to see if I could find staff there was no staff there were no security um, that were present I went back into the office at that particular point after those young men had left the, the child alone and I voiced my concern. Um, and what I was told was, well, this is just what happens. This is expected. And at that particular point, I was upset because it's not what's expected. These are our children. This is our community. And to see a child shaken and scared and fear put me in a place as a parent to say, what if this was my child? And I asked this individual, I said, well, well what do you guys do about this? That's concerning. And then this person said, well, we're short staff here. There's nothing that we can do. Um, due to COVID, kids been out, being out for that significant period of time, they've come back rowdy, and this is just, this is what happens. Um, then the interaction continued to go on from there. And this individual, I asked to speak to someone up higher. Um, and I was told that this person, that there was no one higher than her. Um, and at that point, my daughter just looked and was like, I, this is where I got to come back to. And I did as a parent. I said, I will not return my child to this school if you're telling me that this is just what's expected and that you're short-staffed. Um, 
I said what I would like to file a complaint as a result of what has transpired. And the individual t turned and looked at me and said, get in line with everybody else. Good luck. Um, at that moment, I felt like I felt my child because there's no, there's no reason why. One minute. If we utilize the aspect of it takes a village to raise a child, that this should have happened. And now my child is sitting at home in fear as to where she's gonna go next. Um, and I'm looking for a place for a different district scattering upon return just to make sure that she receives the education that she's supposed to receive and she feels safe while she's at school. And um, speaking to the school that I was at, I had expressed seconds. the aspect of, well, what do, what do you do safe for safety? What is safety? And they said, well, the way things have been lately, there's nothing that we can do about it. And it put me in a place to where I told them, so I'm sending my child to school. I might as well throw her to a pack of wolves and expect for her not to come home in the safe manner in which that I had sent her. So the only thing that I wanted to come today is just to say was like to think about the safety of the children that are out there because now I'm left as a parent to think about the safety of my child and what we're going to do. And she's time. a 4.0 student. Moving on to consent agenda, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda that is before us. So moved. Motion by Mr. Thielen. Second. Second by Mr. Snow. Any abstentions? <clears throat> yes, I have one. <laughs> I am abstaining from item I-8, claim C, due to my um, role with the Omaha Public Schools Foundation. Okay, there's a motion on the floor by Mr. Thielen, second by Mr. Snow, with an abstention from Ms. Cassidy from item I-8. Roll call, Mr. Ray. Erdenberger? Aye. Head? Aye. Holman? Aye. Juarez? Aye. Cracky? Aye. Smith? Aye. Snow? Aye. Thielen? Aye. Cassidy? Aye. Nine aye. Motion carries. Moving on to action items, items J1A, approval of resolution authorizing issuance and sale of bonds. And good evening to you tonight, Mr. Roberts. How are you? Good evening. I'm doing great. How about yourself? But we also have Mr. Bruce Leffler. Yep. We have a whole team here with us tonight. We do. And Mr. Tyler Mullen. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, President Dr. Holman, Vice President Erdenberger, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Logan. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening regarding the district's plans to issue up to $38,850,000 of Series 2022 general obligation bonds. With me this evening are two of the district's valued partners in these transactions. First is Mr. Bruce Leffler with Piper, Piper Sandler, our financial advisor. After a brief overview, Mr. Leffler will provide an update on current market conditions as well as anticipated timing and specifics regarding this issue. Also with us this evening is Mr. Tyler Mullen with Barrett Home, our bond counsel. Mr. Mullen will conclude our brief presentation with some specifics regarding the board resolution in front of you this evening. In May 2018, voters approved a $409.9 million bond issue. That bond issue passed with 67% of the vote. This phase two bond was a follow-up to the phase one bond of 421 million that was passed four years earlier in November of 2014. Both bond issues arose from the 2014 facility plan developed by the district that identified nearly $800 million of needed projects. Under the 2018 bond issue, we have issued three tranches so far, $80 million in December of 2018, $125 million in January of 20, and $140 million last March. On March 2nd, the Budget and Audit Committee uh, was presented with plans for our fourth and final tranche. Tonight, we are seeking approval to proceed with issuing bonds up to $38.85 million. With that, I would like to now turn it over to Mr. Bruce Leffler with Piper Sandler to go through the market conditions and specifics regarding this issue. Thank you. Uh, board members, again, for the record, Bruce Leffler with Piper Sandler in Omaha. 
Um, just to give a, a interesting things that have been happening in the market since the first of the year. Uh, obviously, we've seen from inflation concerns, political unrest with the Ukraine have been the main drivers of the volatility in the bond market. Um, we have seen U.S. Treasuries and municipal bond rates uh, increase uh, since the first of the year to the extent where rates are a good 1% um, higher than they were uh, at the tail end last year in December of 2021. We do see that interest rates, you know, uh, I, I would say that we still think interest rates are, are in a good position, and that comes from being in 36 years of this business where I've seen cycles of interest rates go up and down. <laughs> but, you know, uh, obviously we're comparing things against a very, very attractive market that we had from a borrowing standpoint. Evidenced by the last school district 2021 bond issue being done for 1.71%. Uh, you will note, going backwards on some of those notes, that uh, the 2018 issue was done at 3.83% interest rate at that particular point in time. Um, in today's environment, um, you know, I, I was kind of giving looking as I, clearly as I could through my crystal ball and telling Scott we thought interest rates would be in this 2.6 to 2.75% interest rate. Based on what we're seeing today, we're right on top of that 2.75% interest rate. But the resolution that you have before you authorizes the issuance of the bonds at, at rates that do not exceed 3.5%. So we have a little wiggle room to, and you know, we'll cross our fingers and our toes and make sure that hopefully these things stable out within the last couple of weeks. Uh, as Scott mentioned as well, um, the 2018, 18, excuse me, 2018 issue was done in a par amount of $80 million. That particular issue produced a little over $81 million worth of proceeds to the project. Our series 2020 bond issue of $125 million because of the pricing on that produced a little over $135 million of, of project dollars to the, to the fund, construction fund. The series 2021 bonds at 140 million um, produced 100 and just shy of 155 million dollars worth of proceeds to the bond fund. And I say this to the extent that if you sat down and lined up your numbers and did your math, you'll note that we're actually of 409.9 million dollars that were approved by the voters, we're really ultimately going to look at issuing bonds that are probably in the amount of 380 to 381 million. But that's going to, at the end of the day, produce total bomb construction funds to the project of $409.9 million. Um, because you know we've been through this a little bit for premium pricing on the bonds produced more than the par amount. And so we are tying the proceeds to the amount that was approved by the voters. So $409,900,000 is what is, at the end of the day, will have been put in the construction account. Our, uh, I guess, how am I moving? Just enter? Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, our, our timing that we're looking at as it stands right now, um, bonds will be marketed on March 31. That actual date may move a day or two just because uh, we're, we're talking to the rating agencies uh, on Wednesday of this week. As quickly as they can get that confirmation back of the school district's bond rating, then we'll, we'll be marketing those bonds, but it won't be much later than the end of this month. The sale, pro, the sale will, will provide, will do the bond issue in such a manner that it'll provide $38.55 million of proceeds to the construction account, which will tap that out at the 409.9. Final maturity of the bonds matching up with the outstanding debt at December 15 of 2043. Again, that interest rate averaged at 2.75, but we're right on top of that number. Um, and the current bond rating uh, at, with S&P and Moody's in the AA category right in the middle of the AA category, puts you in the, basically the third best position of bond ratings. Um, uh, I don't see any red flags on the horizon that should give us a whole lot of concern with our conversation with them in a couple of days. So we're gonna anticipate that, uh, that we're gonna see those ratings being in the same place. I don't know if I have, okay, yeah, this is kind of the timing, timetable that we've been through. I think we will still set at the end of the day We'll still be looking at having proceeds on, on hand by April 20th or shortly thereafter, certainly by the end of the month on April. Uh, we will go to bond sale, and again, as we've typically done for the bond sale, we put a, a notice of the bond sale in the financial publication that everybody looks at to know that it's coming. We basically provide essentially a, you know, five to seven days of, of notice on that. Everybody in the world has the opportunity to bid on the bonds as they have in the past, and we take the lowest bid that's available to us on the day that we market those bonds.
I guess I'd stop there to see if there's any particular questions about the process. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Leffler. Can you explain the meeting that, uh, for the voters and people watching, the meeting that will happen with the rating agencies? Uh, yes. So basically, Scott and I will get on the phone with uh, representatives from Moody's on one phone call and Standard & Poor's on the other phone call. Uh, we've, we've double booked ourselves, so we'll be in conversation for a couple of good hours with those folks. Uh, they just go over the district's financials as they have on all of your bond issues. They look at your past audits, your current audits, they look at your current financial position. Provi uh, Scott provides a significant amount of information to them about your current uh, uh, budget to, to actual spending. Um, we have certainly some conversations uh, as it relate to what's happening with the pension. Uh, for the school district, I think that's still very positive news as they as they look at those things. We talk a little bit in general about the uh, demographics as well as the economics for the area, how things are going along, student enrollment, uh, all the basic things that would basically show up in your audit report, and basically answer any questions they have that are in between some of those numbers. It's easy to see those information out of the audit, but sometimes they have additional questions. We have a whole new section on cybersecurity, which is a whole lot of fun to try to detail out and have conversations about. But yes, it's just an analysis by those folks having the opportunity to talk to the school district. I try to help out as much as I can for anything I can uh, and to help the, the rating agencies give you that double A AA and double A two credit rating credit. So, um, but you know, again, have you being having been in the market on an annual basis, it's really not that uh, I won't say thorough, but it's not that onersome just because they already know most of the information. We're mostly just updating stuff from last year. Thank you. Um, right. I also believe the last tranche, I think it was like five minutes or something like that. Uh. JP Morgan, I think. And oh, buying for the up sale. All the bonds for the like, sale of the bonds. For yeah. the sale of the bonds. Yeah. We, we, if you really imagine, yeah, even last year, and the numbers don't make a whole lot of difference, when we get to the bid, we used to provide a half an hour for the bid process. We now provide 15 minutes, <laughs> and it takes about three of those 15 minutes for the bids to come in because it's you know, like anything else. Nobody wants to show their hand too soon. Now, nobody gets to look at anything other than, other than us in the district, but, but yeah, it is kind of an interesting process to go through. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there you go. Great. Good evening. Tyler Mullen, M-U-L-L-E-N with Baird Home Law Firm, 1700 Farnham Street. Those were very thorough uh, reports. Um, like Scott said, uh, the districts in 2018 approved uh, 409,900,000 in general obligation bonds for the district issue to uh, pay for various capital projects within the district. This is the fourth and final um, tranche for uh, under that authorization. Uh, tonight, you have a bond resolution authorizing not to exceed $38,850,000 in general obligation bonds with a true interest cost of not to exceed 3.5%. The bonds will be sold in a competitive bid process, and the, like Bruce said, it's expected to be on March 31st uh, with the board president or the superintendent signing off on the final bid on behalf of the district. Piper Sandler will continue to act as uh, financial advisor for the district and U.S. Bank will, will act as a uh, paying agent. The bond resolution also approves uh, various forms of documents used um, within the sale of the bonds, the preliminary official statement, the notice of sale, and the paying agent agreement. So with that being said, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Ms. Erdenberger. Hi, thank you very much. Um, just to confirm that we are authorizing an interest rate of up to 3.5%, but in the, er in the earlier part of the presentation, the expectation is that it's between, could you give me those numbers yeah, again? Yeah. Sorry. Yes, as of right now, I mean, the, 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 our, our recent conversations uh, have said that we thought their interest rate was gonna be somewhere between 2.6, maybe to 2.75. As of, as of if we were offering bonds today, at least our best take on the market, we'd be right on top of that 2.75. The 3.5 just allows us to not have to come back to the board again because it's, we set it at 2.8 and went to 2.85. You know, it's just, a, it's a parameter 
that as long as we meet that parameter, it still allows for the board president or the... Um, full disclosure, yeah. I was a bond lawyer no, I understand. I at QTAC. So. Yes, yes, I, <laughs> I do understand that, but I guess something I never had to ask from this side of the table before is, and it might be a question to Mr. Roberts, is that if we've built in, I mean, worst case, you know, all hell is breaking loose. Right. We can't get anything under 3.5, which we've built right. in, and you don't have to come back. I'm assuming we've run the numbers at 3.5 and we're good to go at 3.5. Is that right? Yes, we are. As uh, Bruce mentioned last year when we did the 21 issue, we got the uh, rate at 1.71%. So we've been below the threshold for all the tranches so far. We'll be just fine at 3.5. That's what I was wondering. If we get out to market quickly enough, we shouldn't see 3.5, I hope. No, right, exactly, exactly. Well, the world is changing. Well, in front it changes of us. On the, by the minute. Uh, one other thing I guess I'd add is, and, and we've kind of gone back on this, the presentation or the, the estimates we made at the time of the election in 2018 had the $409 million for the bonds being issued at something maybe just shy of 4% was the estimates we made as far as a levy impact would have been. So we've been less than that on all three of the issues we've done for that. It's, you know, so, so we're in good stead from that. So point. arguably, even if this came in at 4% somehow, our, uh, the aggregate rate would oh, be certainly. significantly, oh, significantly lower, lower than yes. that. Yes. And what you're saying is that when the bond sale opens, our bonds go about as fast as Elton John tickets? There we, yeah, that's, that's, that's one way to put it, exactly. I'm, I'm so, showing uh, my they're, age. Although they're, <laughs> although they're cheaper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's so much greater return on the Elton John tickets. You know, it's, it's actually kind Thank of you. fun to watch the auction because there's no activity until the last three minutes. And then everybody drops their bid in at the last second. So, but they go well. I think I saw that in trading places, didn't I? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, colleagues? Fantastic. Thank you all so much for the Thank fantastic you. presentation. All right, with that, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion to approve the resolution authorizing issuance and sales of bonds. So moved. Second. Moved by Vice President Erderberger, seconded by Ms. Cracky. Roll call, Mr. Ray. Head. Yes. Holman. Aye. Juarez. Yes. Cracky. Aye. Smith. Aye. Snow. Aye. Thielen. Aye. Cassidy. Aye. Erdenberger. Aye. Nine, nine. Motion carries. Moving on now to item J1B, approval of the report of the legislative committee, including recommended legislative positions. Mr. Head, good evening. Thank you, President Dr. Holman. And there's not a lot to report tonight. We actually don't have any new, uh, new recommended positions. Um, the legislature is in day 45 out of 60, so three quarters of the way there uh, can't, uh, can't count. Uh, quickly enough for them to get to day 60. Um, they've been working on the budget for roughly the last week and a half, probably will be for the rest of the week. Um, so we're still keeping an eye on, uh, on activity down there, but there's not a whole lot um, that concerns us as of at least right now. Great, thank you so much. So we have no motion for um, legislative as there are no positions reported. Moving on now to information items, item J2A, staff presentation on K-12 mathematics textbook and related resource material adoptions for use beginning with the 2022-2023 school year. And we have a whole team of folks here with us tonight. Hello, Ms. Dreesen, how are you? I'm great. It's so good to see good you. Good evening, President Dr. Holman, Vice President Erdenberger, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Logan, and colleagues. My name is Marnie Dreesen, and I am here with Deanna Moise, Anthony Moss, and Lisa Holland. We are excited to bring you our recommendations for the kindergarten through 12th grade math resource adoption and implementation. Our elementary resources for math were adopted in 2013. Our resources for middle school and high school were adopted in 2011. Since that time, there have been shifts in mathematical teaching practices, including a stronger focus on building student understanding, connecting concepts and skills, and applying mathematics to problems both inside and outside of the classroom. Given the central role of high quality instructional materials as a resource, 
and their potential for supporting instruction, the selection of our resources was not taken lightly, and we engaged multiple stakeholders in the process. Requests for proposals were sent out by the district. The initial reviews by curriculum and instruction support included teaching and learning consultants from the special education department, ESL and migrant education, dual language, and the gifted and talented education program. After these initial reviews, we elicited input from several groups who looked at the materials with varied lenses. Multiple teachers from each school reviewed publisher presentations and completed a quality materials rubric. From this review, we narrowed the list of products down to two for each grade level and course. From November to February, several stakeholders, uh, stakeholder review sessions were held that included community members, the District Citizens Advisory Committee, and our English Learner Parent Involvement Program. Each group shared supportive feedback for the products. A vital step of our process was ensuring that the materials reflect the community and students that we serve. A group of individuals from various organizations in the community came together to do this important work. This included, but was not limited to, members from the Urban League of Nebraska, Children's Respite Care Center, and the Boys and Girls Clubs of the Midlands. The most exciting and informative step in the process was allowing our teachers and students to use the resources in classrooms for 10 to 12 weeks. Dual language teachers and special education teachers participated in this field test of products as well. Teachers made the curriculum come to life with student-centered experiences and real-world problem solving. Every student in our district deserves the opportunity to learn from high-quality, standards-aligned instructional materials to prepare for success in co college, career, and in life, as outlined in our portrait of a graduate. The feedback for the chosen materials provided by our teachers, a small sample of which you can see on the screen here, is a testament to the energy and excitement our teachers and students have for meaningful mathematical experiences. At the elementary level and middle school levels, teachers shared a preference for Envision Math as it best meets the needs of our students in Omaha Public Schools. The resources are all available in Spanish for our dual language classrooms and include support for our English learners. A comprehensive math diagnosis and intervention system is included for use in our special, special education programs and in our classrooms. Open-ended rich tasks challenge students to formulate and solve multi-step problems, justify their reasoning, and extend knowledge and understanding of higher order thinking skills. This preference for Envision from teachers, along with our data analysis from each group, has led us to recommend Savis Envision Mathematics for kindergarten through eighth grade. Beyond our own reviews, we look to national reviews Envision Mathematics 2020 to 2021 meets expectations on ed reports for all grade levels. The reviewers concluded that Envision Mathematics meets all of the criteria for K-8 with a green rating for all three gateways, which include focus and coherence, mathematical practices, and usability. The alignment of resources from kindergarten through eighth grade allows for smooth transitions from grade to grade, and also from elementary to middle school. On page one of your attachment, that looks like this, you'll see this resource includes math tasks that promote student understanding, practice, and application. Envision's instructional model supports consistent implementation of student-centered teaching and learning. Effective teaching practices, such as student conversations, multiple strategies, and open-ended problem solving are at the heart of every lesson. This resource provides opportunities to focus on the Nebraska mathematical process standards, which support students' understanding during instruction, practice, and assessment. Page two of your attachment on the other side demonstrates how families from kindergarten through eighth grade can access videos available in each lesson as well as homeschool connection letters that can support at-home learning.
Thank you, Mrs. Dreesen. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Deanna Moisse. I'm the teaching and learning consultant for secondary mathematics. As students progress and transition from middle school to high school mathematics, advanced and honors courses remain available to students in grades 6 through 12. For the essential concept courses and their honors components within the high school path options, we are recommending Houghton Mifflin Harcourt series into AGA. The instructional materials reviewed for HMH into AGA meet expectations for focus and coherence and attend to the full intent of the mathematical content for all students across Algebra 1-2, Geometry, and our Algebra 3-4 courses. This resource engages students in mathematics at a level of sophistication appropriate to high school. It makes meaningful connections within a single course and throughout the series. And it explicitly identifies and builds on prior knowledge and standards. HMH into AGA keeps student understanding at the forefront and provides explicit guidance for mathematical discussions so students are engaged and their voices can be heard throughout the lessons. Page three of your attachment highlights how lessons are designed for coherence across topics with the inclusions of standards and best practices. Applications and interactive technology tools are included throughout the series. The OPS High School Mathematics course options, outlined also in one of your additional attachments, allow students opportunities to pursue mathematics based on their own personal needs, goals, and aspirations. The recommended texts for the elective and advanced mathematics courses within these options are aligned to the College Board and our post-secondary partners. This includes our current partnership with Metro Community College and the Nebraska Math Readiness Project. One of your attachments titled OPS MCC Math Dual Enrollment includes additional information about this exciting opportunity for our students. The recommended resources include a consumable textbook subscription for all students kindergarten through eighth grade as well as digital subscriptions to the materials. New consumables are provided for students each year of the adoption. Students in high school courses will have access to a hard copy textbook as well as student resources on the digital platforms. These resources integrate teacher-led instruction with the use of digital tools and technology to help students learn and make sense of mathematical ideas. Field test teachers shared their excitement about the supports provided, which include a variety of options, such as online checks for learning, instructional videos, extra practice opportunities, assessments, and assignable tasks with feedback. A blended learning model can be achieved through the one-to-one -one technology initiative as the materials are compa compatible with student devices and OPS digital platforms. The digital resources allow teachers to meet students where they are, provide practice, extend their learning, and plan accordingly. Thank you for your continued support of mathematics education. The adoption of these instructional materials will lay the foundation for effective mathematics teaching and learning for our students of the Omaha Public Schools. Curriculum and instruction support is currently crafting a comprehensive implementation plan that will begin this summer and include curriculum writing and professional learning. We look forward to providing professional development opportunities as we continue to monitor and support the use of high quality instructional materials. But no, and under, we know and understand it is the talents and skills of our teachers that bring the curriculum to life for our students. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to bringing this back along with the negotiated agreements from selected vendors for your approval at a future meeting. First, thank you all so much for being here tonight, and thank you all for your hard work. Um, I know this is no easy task, and so we are very appreciative for all of your work, community, staff, and students who participated in um, this math book um, selection. So with that, colleagues, are there any questions? Mr. Thielen? Thank you, Dr. Holman. Um, 
so you, you touched on a little bit the digital uh, resources and um, access to hard copy materials. So I just kind of want to understand um, a little bit more about you know how a student would have access to the hard copies. Is it is it something they request or is it something that is automatically provided? How are we? What's our first? Our, what, what, how are we starting? Are we starting with to encourage them to do digital? Um, no, they will have both options. So okay. K eight receives one consumable per student and automatic access through Clever to all digital platforms. Okay. At the high school level, there will be a textbook available for the students, um, should they choose to carry one, um, and then the digital platforms are automatically accessible. Okay, and the digital, I know there's a lot of different ways that the digital um, materials can be accessed. Is this something where you have to have consistent internet access to be able to get to those materials, or is it something that you can download and use at home without internet? Both. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Mr. Snow. Thank you, uh, Madam President, Dr. Holman. <clears throat> First, I thank everybody for uh, your presentation. It was perfect. Um, I remember when Dr. Logan got a, became superintendent, we were at an event, and someone said, kids don't like math and she corrected them she said all kids love math and that was just a point of putting the right instruction the support the tools and having our teachers meet those expectations also having our parents know what to expect and our kids will rise to that occasion so I do have like two questions um, the first one is communication what is the communication that will be happening to the families, uh, the communication to the families, and then also how many teachers participated in the review and selecting these options? Um, I can speak to middle school and high school counts. So we had, um, at the secondary level, we had upwards of 40 to 50 field testers. Um, I don't have the exact student count, um, but each of those teachers has anywhere from one classroom that participated up to all 150 to 180 students that they have in those courses. And at the elementary level, we had a teacher participate from every school. So we had a total of 75, and that included four, or excuse me, five dual language partnerships as well. Thank you, that's amazing. I'll just sneak in and say about the communication. I hope that you're able to see some of the handouts that we were able to provide that were really user friendly, that we would be looking to making sure that we're getting that information out and of course working with our district communications to be able to share that information through our parents and also the schools as a whole uh, to communicate what we're doing with our new math. New math. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Ms. Erdenberger. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Um, I attended one of the evening um, community reviews and it was very professionally obviously conducted but also very thorough and gave a lot of parents an opportunity to look at, um, at the books and uh, I, I applaud your choices. They're laying out in the boardroom right uh, over there and um, they uh, makes almost makes me want to go back to <laughs> taking math in elementary and junior high and maybe even high school. Um, a couple questions. So thank you very much for working so hard because um, as uh, Mr. Snow alluded, uh, kids seem to come to school thinking they're not going to like it. And that was one of the things that I really appreciated about at least the elementary books that I was looking at. They just looked fun. And I think that that's obviously a really important step towards liking something. Um, one of the things that I appreciated, I think it was in your presentation, and I remember it from that evening too, was that, and this kind of gets to what Ms. Christofferson was talking about, but rather than the parent communication about what's about to happen, my recollection is that at least at the elementary level there is some, and I think there's a reference in the presentation, to um, weekly or monthly um, communications with the parents about these are the concepts that we're teaching now, and the you know sort of so the parents can know what's happening. Um, I I don't mean to be putting you on the spot, but does the same thing happen at the the uh, secondary level? 
not that parents are as able to <laughs> tackle some of these things, but I was just wondering, do is, is there a, a mechanism or do we anticipate one for getting parents to know what's going on in their kids' math classes at the secondary level? Um, just to piggyback off Mrs. Christofferson, we'll work with district communications after we um, go through all of the materials that are available. And there's a, a variety of courses and vendors that we're partnering with at the secondary level um, where I can't say something completely overall as, as well as we can K-8 to know that there's those home letters provided for each subject in grade level. Yeah, I know that all the elementary kids are moving in one big blob so it's easier to communicate what's going on as opposed to the you know 20 different math classes that are going on in secondary but that was one of my questions now the consumables are only at the elementary level is that right or are they consumables at the secondary as K well consumables are k-8 okay. so elementary and middle got it thank you and if I remember correctly, we did a lot to incorporate the Khan Academy or included them quite a bit when we were still in COVID, you know, technology only <laughs> mode. Um, and I was just wondering how that interfaces with what we're doing now. Actually, that was pre-COVID. We went to visit a school district uh, in uh, Long Beach, California. And uh, Ms. Moise can talk a little bit about Khan. Oh, okay. Thank you. So we plan to continue a partnership with Khan, and we have two methodologies that we use. Khan Academy District Partnership is at our high school level, um, and we've been able to be a partner in a pilot program with them. And then we utilize Map Accelerator, which is powered by Khan Academy at grades three through eight. And there's still value in that, even with the additional digital resources. So we'll be defining what the purposes of each additional or uh, supplemental resource for the products that we choose. That's great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, they do look like fun books. So thank you for that. <laughs> if, if I may, uh, the I think it's important to note that the Con Accelerator, the NWEA uh, Map Accelerator is personalized for each child and that it is linked to their map assessment and uh, so it's adaptive to and basically the students practice uh, based on how they do on their map assessment I think that's a that's a we were very excited to be able to there were very few districts that got to participate uh, and uh, a lot of legwork that was done by the team to uh, over uh, almost a year and a half in order to get uh, the MAP Accelerator, uh, not just in our schools, but also uh, to make sure that it was aligned with Nebraska College and Career uh, Standards. So I thank our team for, for all of that work and persistence uh, working with Khan and their legal team. Ms. Cracky. I thought you had an excellent presentation too. And with the consumables going home, I'm assuming they go home with the student and they have them with them. They so can. that so in that case from the K eight, those parents are gonna see what is going on. They don't need to look at their uh, computer if they don't want to. So they can just see it right there. So I think they're gonna be well informed. That's what it appears to be. And uh, I understand that the flashcards will be available for parents to ask for or teachers to get for their classrooms so that the children can be using those also. Because I think that's really important. Absolutely. We want them to know all the facts by the end of second grade so they can do multiplication and onward in third grade. So it's always a goal of ours and, and it's, I think math is fun. So I had a good time with the children in my class with math. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cassidy. Thank you. Um, for the record, Ms. Erdenberger, Vice President Erdenberger, I secretly pray at night that my children will not ask me for help with math. <laughs> so <laughs> I would have been the child requesting the hard copy book to go home. Um, but all kidding aside, thank you folks um, for the presentation. This is a huge undertaking and very much needed in our district. So um, I appreciate it greatly, the thought that has gone into this. I mean, you can tell the process was just very streamlined and transparent, so thank you for that. Um, and it has been 
I don't know if I'd say fun looking at all the books in the back. I might steal the calculus one out there today just to go home and torment my child with. But um, anyway, uh, questions though. I do have a couple questions. Um, so you mentioned you'll be coming back to the board for approval. When, what are the next steps? What does the timeline look like for us to visit this again? Um, our recommendations will be taken um, to negotiations. Okay. And then once we are through negotiations, then we'll bring it back to the board. Okay, and that's when we have all of the numbers per se. Correct. Okay, and then I'm assuming that um, you did mention PD for teachers. Can you speak a little bit about that type of, what, what will occur with that timeline for that? Um, as soon as possible. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it'll it'll work out in negotiations what the exact professional development plan okay. is. Um, but I think we are planning and hoping to to begin um, offering with some offerings as soon as June. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Will any of it occur within this school year? Or will it all be um, summertime and then, of course, into fall? Sounds like hopefully sooner the better. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay, and I just have. An easy question, I think. Um, um, during the presentation, it was mentioned about the different community organizations that participated um, throughout this process. For any upcoming curriculum adoptions, how might someone in the community who might be interested in contributing or participating, how might they be able to do so? They can always reach out to Mrs. Christofferson. <laughs> um, but just staying on the district Facebook page or the OPS website and the announcements on there, um, that's usually where we promote when those community review sessions are. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you for being here tonight and for all your hard work. Thank you. We certainly look forward to this upcoming vote. Any other questions, colleagues, before they depart? Great. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Very nice job. Yes. All righty then. Moving on to our next item on the agenda, item J2B, Omaha School Employees Retirement System, otherwise known as OSERS, ad hoc committee update, and Vice President Erdenberger will be sharing tonight. Okay, just to remind everybody the background, and some people haven't been here for all of it, but um, a couple, four years or so, the investment responsibilities, am I right, four years, five? Anyway, the investment decisions with respect to OSERS are no longer part of anything related to OPS. All of the investment is being done at the state pension fund level. And based on statutes that were passed last summer, the administration of the Omaha School Employees Retirement uh, System will be transitioned also over to the state pension plan and that's going to that transition is going to take place over the next I think it ends in September of 2024 so um, between now and then we uh, there is a board of trustees with OPS employees board members so on and so forth and community men members responsible for OSERS but of course our responsibility is very limited basically overseeing the administration that's kind of a well-oiled machine uh, he, that's taking place here uh, in the TAC building is where those employees are located. But like I said, that's going to be transferred out uh, in September of oh, between now and September 2024. We also, as a board, have an ad hoc committee of which I am serving as chair. I believe Mr. Snow is on it. I'm trying to remember who else. I can't remember who's on the... I, I got off once the, oh, the last part. You're doing <laughs> on that. Okay, I'm trying to remember who's on... I can be back on it if you want me to. Oh, Mr. Head is on... He's on the Board of Trustees and on the Ad Hoc Committee, as am I and Tracy. Okay, thank you. Um, the only reason I'm confused is because in the middle of spring break, it was a little hard to put together this Ad Hoc Committee meeting, so it was just Jane. Um, and therefore not a committee meeting. But we did have a discussion. I just want to get you all up to speed. The process is going forward on a regular and 
forward basis. The internal dis meetings are taking place here in the TAC building. There's a lot of computer issues, HR issues. I mean, everybody needs to be talking the same language. And then on top of that, everything that we do with our administration has to be upgraded or folded into the administration that's taking place at the state level. And it's a little confusing because some of the things we're doing are better than what they're doing down there. So they are changing their system a little. And at the same time, some of the things that they do are better than what we do. So we're changing our system too. So there's, there's a lot of movement taking place. I don't think any of our pensioners will notice it. They will all get their checks on a regular basis. But there is a lot of conversation and understanding about who does what that's taking place and will continue to take place. And just want you to know that that's happening on a very regular basis. The other thing is, is that we just completed, you guys might remember, we had a report about a compliance audit that took place. That is, is the, uh, are the policies and procedures of OSERS, do they match what the legal requirements are, primarily federal and some state? That compliance audit was completed last fall and uh, appropriate changes were made. Now there is a financial audit that's being initiated by the state of how we are operating or how OSERS is operating. I think most of you can assume that just like your checkbook, no matter how careful you are, chances are you made a mistake at some point or another. We don't anticipate um, because we've been audited on an annual basis by other auditors that there's any issues, but that's what's happening now. We may get a report from the state identifying some uh, corrections that need to be taken at the financial administration level. We do not anticipate that it's gonna be very much. And now you know everything I know about OSERS. Thank you very much. Any questions, colleagues? All righty. I would just like to say after we grilled Miss Cassidy last time, she is, she's uh, entitled to at least one hard question. I'm on your committee, Jane, I don't. Oh yeah, <laughs> but you were not. <laughs> Thank you. <Whew. laughs> okay, folks, moving on to receive the reports. We have one report on the agenda this evening, item K1, CBOC update for the phase two bond programs, February, 2022. Moving on to closed session, Vice President Erdenberger. Sir, used at the moment. Um, I move that the Board of Education go into closed session for the protection of the public interest and for the prevention of needless injury to the reputation of individuals. To discuss with the Superintendent Secretary to the Board, Charles Wakefield and Legal Counsel, negotiations, real estate, pending litigation, and legal advice. I have a motion on the floor by Vice President Erdenberger. Is there a second? Yes. Second. Second by Ms. Crackety. Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Cracky. I apologize, Ms. Cracky. Ms. Cracky, roll call, please. Holman. Aye. Aye. Juarez. Aye. Cracky. Aye. Smith. Aye. Snow. Aye. Thielen. Aye. Cassidy. Aye. Erdenberger. Aye. Head. Aye. Nine aye. Motion carries. Let me remind the board that the purpose for closed session is for the protection of public interest and for the prevention of needless injury to the reputation of individuals. To discuss with the superintendent, secretary to the board, Charles Wakefield and legal counsel, negotiations, real estate, pending litigation and legal advice. Let the record reflect that the board went into closed session at 7.44 p.m.
Let the record reflect that the board came out of closed session at 8-12, meeting adjourned.